Praise the Lord. I want to thank BSAS for the invitation to come and preach the gospel to you tonight. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We're going to be journeying from verses 11 to 16. I gave my heart to Jesus and was baptized in November of 1991. Yet I didn't truly have a deep, personal, heartfelt experience with Jesus Christ until about the year 2000 when I was getting my undergraduate degree from Florida International University. As a matter of fact, I wanted to deepen my experience with Jesus Christ, so I decided that I wanted to journey through Scripture and and go from Genesis to Revelation, so I decided what I was going to do was get the one-year Bible reading plan and start reading that and start journeying through Scripture. And then one of the other things that I did is I picked up this wonderful little book written by a wonderful little lady called The Desire of Ages. And I had a face-to-face encounter with Jesus Christ, and my heart was converted, and my life has never been the same ever since. You know, some people, when they describe their their, 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 their conversion experience, they describe it as as a dynamic 180 experience, where there was a moment, there was an event where it all clicked, and you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. And then there's others who may have had an experience, which is just like mine, which may have been more of a gradual process that, that took place over the course of, of a few years. It was more of a journey. However you experienced it, mine was so deep that at one point, I found myself at a fast food restaurant in line waiting for my food with my Bible open as I'm waiting to get my food. You were supposed to laugh right there. That's all right. However, I encountered a dilemma. When I started reading the scriptures and I came across the children of Israel, and I could not understand how it is that the children of Israel could could disobey God repeatedly so many times when God had brought them through so many things. I mean, I was scratching my head. It, It became a conundrum for me. As a matter of fact, I would read the Bible and I would see how God, God, he he manifests himself to the children of Israel. And then he delivers them from Egypt with a, with a mighty hand. And then, and then God, he, 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 he brings them into the desert and he, he gives them the law of love. And then after that, he manifests rain and he, and he rains down manna from heaven and quail cuisine. And yet the only thing that the children of Israel know how to do is complain against God and Moses. It sounds a little familiar to me as I read the story of the children of Israel because As I read the story, I see how God finally, the only thing he could do was raise up the second generation of the children of Israel and bring them into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. And as long as Joshua lived, they served the Lord. But once Joshua died, the Bible declares one of the most frustrating and frequent statements in Scripture. The Bible goes on to declare, then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. This becomes a recurring theme throughout the book of Judges. Uh, it, it's a continuous cycle. First, they, they rebel against God, and then after that, there, there is oppression by the enemies, and then the children of Israel, the people of God, they begin to outcry to God for help, and then God comes and he delivers them, and then they rebel against God, and then after that, they go and they are oppressed by their enemies, and then there's an outcry for help to God, and then after that, God comes and he delivers them again. The children of Israel, they forsake God, they they worship idols and are oppressed by their enemies. Then God in his mercy, how many of you are grateful for serving a merciful God? God in his mercy, he'll raise up a judge to deliver his people. Then like a broken record, again, comes that awful statement. And again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. I would get so frustrated when I would see that statement. I would say to myself, why is it that the children of Israel can't just get it together, just love God, just serve God? Things will be so much easier. And then God began to sit me down. And he began to speak to me. And Jesus began to say, CJ, through his word, CJ, does that sound a little familiar to you? And I think, honestly, if we really are honest, I think the reason why sometimes when we read the scriptures and we read those stories of the children of Israel, the reason it frustrates us, the reason it annoys us a little bit is because, honestly, we can truly identify 
with the experience of the children of Israel. I mean, if, you, if you're honest, if your story was read like you read the story of the children of Israel, it would probably find the same statement stated about you. You can insert your name there. And again, CJ did evil in the sight of the Lord. By the time you get to Judges chapter 6, you find the children of Israel in a position of defeat because the children of Israel had failed to drive out all the inhabitants of the land and began to worship their idols. Now the Midianites, who they had previously defeated, were destroying their produce, ravaging their land, and oppressing the people of God. They had neglected to drive out the people from the land. And it is also because we have neglected to drive out some of the things in our lives that we too find ourselves in a posture of defeat in the presence of the enemy, called by God but unable to fulfill our potential in God. However, I've got good news tonight. I said I've got good news tonight. I said my Jesus reaches down and he goes down to the guttermost and the uttermost. And one of the beautiful things about the book of Judges is the picture that we get of a loving God who refuses to let go of those whom he's called. And in Judges 6, we'll discover God's desire for us to embrace three powerful principles for fulfilling our calling as mighty men and women of valor. I want to invite you to pray to this loving God with me right now. Jesus, we invite your presence here once again. We thank you for the worship we thank you that we can experience unity in the Holy Spirit tonight as we come to have an encounter with you and not the speaker. And I pray, Lord, that, that you will be seen, that you will be heard, and dear Jesus, that you will be responded to in the name of Jesus. Amen. Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 11. Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 11. And the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. You mighty man of valor. I am so glad tonight that we serve a God who looks beyond our, our feeble posture and sees our future potential. As a matter of fact, God calls us what we are and what we will be right now. God looks Gideon, who is in hiding. Where are you hiding tonight? Who is in hiding straight in the eye and calls him a mighty man of valor. Now, I believe here at the Friday Night Experience that there are some men and women of God who God has called to be mighty men and women of valor. You see, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a mighty man or woman of valor, you've gotta first get God's perspective. You've gotta get God's perspective. I'm so glad that we serve a God who brings us to where he is so we can see things the way he sees them. Amen? Uh, uh, our calling is based on what God says we are and not what we currently look like. It was a sad day when he passed. But if you and I met Steve Jobs in 1972, we would have written him off as an abject failure. Uh, not only was he abandoned by his parents, but also uh, he was adopted and dropped out of college after his first semester. He was often found sleeping on the floor in friends' rooms, returning Coke bottles for food money, and getting weekly free meals from the local Hare Krishna temple. Now, if you and I had seen him, we would have written him off as a failure, yet God would have been there in his situation, looked at him in 1972, and said, you innovative billionaire. I remember when I was in high school, my guidance counselor sat me down and looked at me and she said to me, CJ, at most, the best you're going to be able to do is actually go to a community college, which I was okay with. 
And then, then in the conversation, the course of the conversation, she basically goes on to tell me, you'll never be able to attain, you'll never be able to exceed academically. And I stand here to you today uh, rebuking that lie because today I stand before you working on my second master's degree to God be the glory. You got to get God's perspective. The Israelites have been oppressed by the Midianites for seven years now. Uh, the situation had gotten so bad that the, the Bible says that they were hiding in dens, caves, and strongholds in the mountains. In this story, we find Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And I can just see Gideon looking over his shoulder to make sure that nobody sees what he's doing. And then suddenly he hears a voice. A startled Gideon looks up to see this, this divine being the, uh, who the Bible calls the angel of the Lord standing right in front of him. And the words from this divine messenger comes to Gideon as a complete surprise. Uh, first, he says, the Lord is with you. Now, one might read that and say, well, yes, yes, the Lord will be with him when he goes on later on to fight the Midianites. But, but I believe if we consider that text just a little bit carefully, I think we'll find something that the Bible is, is whispering to us here. There's something a little bit more richer here. Uh, the verse says, the Lord, that is Jehovah, that is Yahweh, is, present tense, with you. As in, he's right here, right there, with Gideon. And then this begs the question, who is then the angel of the Lord who is standing with Gideon? Well, in verse 19, verse 14, it says, verse 14, then the Lord turned to him and said, then the Lord turned to him and said, and it goes on later to say, then the Lord said to him, have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? Then if you also consider uh, Gideon's reaction to him in verse 22 of the same chapter, the Bible records now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, alas, O Lord, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. You see a similar appearance of this angel of the Lord just a few chapters over in Judges chapter 13, if you want to go with me there. Judges chapter 13, when he appears to Samson's parents in verse 21. The Bible again goes on to record about this mysterious angel of the Lord. It says, when the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. Friends, this is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ come in human form. This is Jesus. As he is mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Emmanuel, God with us. The same God who in the beginning spoke and worlds were spun into existence has come down to tell Gideon that he is with him. And I dare to tell you tonight that same God is saying the exact same thing to you tonight. And he is not only with him, but he gives Gideon his divine perspective. He declares that uh, this man who looks defeated and is in hiding is, in fact, a mighty man of valor. You may look defeated tonight. You may look down. You may even be unsure of your purpose and calling in life. But I'm here to tell you tonight that, that, that no matter how you see yourself tonight, uh, God looks down to you tonight and he says to you, I am with you, you mighty man, you mighty woman of valor. You've got to get God's perspective of what he says about you in his word. But Gideon is no different than us. As a matter of fact, he has his doubts and objections as to, as to who God says he is. As a matter of fact, if you go with me to Judges chapter 6 again in verse 13, Gideon actually starts to get an attitude with God. It goes on to say, Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us. You can almost catch the sarcasm there. If the Lord is with us, then, then, then why then has all this happened to us? 
And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of from Egypt? Uh, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. But I love what the Lord says next. It says in verse 14, Then the Lord turned to him. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of of the Midianites. The Lord doesn't even respond to his little rant, his little complaint, just like how the father in the prodigal son parable virtually ignores and interrupts his son's repentance speech. Immediately, he restores him back to his position in the family. In like manner, God turns to Gideon and cuts to the chase and says, go in this might of yours. Have I not sent you? See, if you're going to be a man or a woman of valor tonight, you've got to go in God's strength. You've got to go in God's strength. God is the one who is calling you tonight, and he's calling you to go in his strength, not your own. And he even takes responsibility for sending you. He says, have I not sent you? it will be the equivalent, somewhat, of President Obama calling you as you are working at Mickey D's. And he says, I'm going to give you a six-figure income. And I'm also going to send you overseas as my personal ambassador. And in addition to the salary, uh, you'll get free housing, a, a, a government-subsidized health insurance plan, a, a government life insurance, and five weeks vacation. Then Obama says to you, I need you to go and represent the United States. And now if you went from flipping burgers to going and representing President Obama overseas and all the power and all the things that that involves, you would consider that a big deal, wouldn't you? Not so with Gideon. Uh, well, the God of this universe has just called Gideon to go in his strength. And then he promises Gideon that he shall deliver Israel from the hand of the Midianites. And instead of praising God for the honor, he begins to get an attitude with God, uh, saying, uh, if he really was with them, then, then, then why is all this bad stuff happening to me, God? Uh, then he complains about how God used to move in the past, but, but now it seems like he's not moving at all in our lives. And, and God, I remember when you first called me. I remember the miracles used to work for me in the past. I, I remember when I didn't think I would get cleared at Andrews University, but somehow you stepped in, somehow you intervened, and now I'm here getting my degree at Andrews University. God, I remember when you used to come in and fix my mess, but now, God, where are you? Gideon sounds a lot like us, doesn't he? Yet he seems to have spiritual amnesia. He seems to have forgotten that the reason the children of Israel are in the mess that they're in right now is because of their own disobedience. Yet here is Jesus, ready to save, ready to deliver, ready to restore. That sounds just like my God, doesn't it? He, he looks beyond our faults, and, and he sees our needs. God says, I need you tonight to go in my strength. God says, I've called you mighty men and women of valor, not because of anything that you have done, not because of your status, not because of your strengths, because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You see, it's not about you tonight. Your calling even, uh, isn't even so much dependent on your academic achievements or degrees. Barry Black is reported to have once said that the stupidest people he ever met, he had to call them doctor. Now God's word to you tonight is, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God needs some people who will dare to go in his strength. And he says to you tonight, have I not sent you Friday night experience? Gideon still doesn't get it. He still has some objections for God in verse 15. Go with me, Judges 6, verse 15. Uh, he, he said to him, oh my Lord, how can, and listen to this, how can I save Israel? 
He's still thinking it's about him. How can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. But I love again what the Lord says. Verse 16, and the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. You shall defeat the Midianites as one man. You see, Gideon is still trying to refer to his earthly status and position. In essence, Gideon is saying, Lord, I don't qualify. Yet God is trying to say, none of that matters anymore, seeing that I have sent you in my strength, seeing that I will be with you. When will we ever get it that God calls, does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called? You see, if you're going to go in God's strength, if you're going to be a man or woman of valor, you've got to recognize that God sends the unlikely. God sends the unlikely. As a matter of fact, God gets more glory for sending the unlikely candidates like you and myself. I'm reminded of Ellen Harmon, due to a serious injury, uh, was never able to finish the third grade. And when God called her to the prophetic gift, she too objected. She also was like Gideon, and she was sickly, uneducated, a young woman who was going to listen to this young teenager. Yet today, she is the most translated woman writer in the history of literature and the most translated American author of either gender. Why? Because God sends the unlikely. And this should have been no shock to Gideon. Just consider the previous judges that came before him. Uh, Ehud was left-handed. Deborah was a female. Jael wasn't even an Israelite. By sending these unlikely candidates, God is showing that deliverance comes from him and not by human power. Just look at some of God's recruits from the past. Uh, Moses claimed not to be a good speaker. Uh, Jonah ran from God. Jacob was a liar. Noah got drunk. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair. Jeremiah was depressed. Solomon was rich in wisdom but poor in lifestyle. And John the Baptist was just plain poor. Uh, Timothy was too young. Abraham was too old. Lazarus was dead. Sarah was barren. Naomi was a widow. And Peter lacked self-control. Uh, God just needs some people that are willing to say yes to him. You may feel insignificant or unqualified tonight. You may feel like, God, uh, you got the wrong person. You may even want to say to God, uh, God, I just can't do this. And he will look at you and say with a big smile on his face, perfect. You're the right candidate for the job. Surely I will be with you, you mighty man, you mighty woman of valor. Have I not sent you? Friends, Jesus stood before Pilate, bleeding, and he didn't look very mighty. As a matter of fact, the Bible goes on to say in John chapter 19 and verse 10, it says, then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and, 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 and the power to release you? And then Jesus, as if he can't take it anymore, he has to respond. He says, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And then when they raised Jesus on that cross... Uh, to the onlooking crowd, he didn't look so valiant. And that Friday evening, when they placed him in the tomb, he didn't look so victorious. But early Sunday morning, my Jesus got up from the grave. He got up with all power in his hands. He is victorious. He is triumphant. And as a matter of fact, my Jesus is the mighty man of valor. And so he comes to you now, right where you are right where you are tonight, right where you are in your life. And he calls you to go. He calls you tonight to get his perspective. He calls you tonight to go in his strength. He calls you tonight to recognize that he sends the unlikely. That includes you, that includes me. And he's calling you tonight to stand up, 
and be like him, a mighty man of valor. Many of you know the story. Gideon goes on to defeat the Midianites, the Midianite army, with just 300 men. As a matter of fact, that's the original 300 movie. But before God sends him to go and fulfill his purpose, before God sends him to fulfill his destiny, he calls him to go and he calls him to tear down an idol and build an altar in the very place where that idol was. I believe tonight God calls you men and women of valor. But he needs you to tear down some idols that are in your life. There are some idols that you have allowed to erect in your life, very much like the children of Israel. See, the beautiful thing about God is that the children of Israel were still called by God even though they had disobeyed him many, many, many times in the past. It never stopped God from going down and saying, you mighty man of valor, you mighty woman of valor, you see, the idols in our lives doesn't stop God from pursuing us. God is calling us to take those idols that we have allowed to be established in our lives. And then what he's asking is in that very place, I want you to surrender that thing to me, your life, a living sacrifice unto God, a sweet-smelling aroma to Jesus. You can't do it by yourself. And so he promises you the promise of the Holy Spirit to empower you to do that. And so tonight, I really want you to consider this psalm because, you see, Jesus wants it all today. Jesus wants our hearts. He wants everything that we have. That includes you. That includes me. So I just want you to consider the words to this psalm, and I'll come back and pray. But I want you to consider, give God your all. Let go of your idols and give it all to him.
He wants it all today. You think it's too much for Jesus to ask for our all? I think I remember somewhere that Jesus gave his all for us. And Jesus asks us to live for him because he is living for us right now. And the beautiful thing about God, and as you see in the story of Gideon, is that God is not intimidated by your mess. He's not intimidated by your mess. He can handle it. He's handled it in my life, and I believe he can handle it in yours. Do you want to be a mighty man or woman of valor tonight? I want to invite you to stand with me. We're going to pray. But as we pray, I'm going to pause at one particular moment in the prayer, and I want you, you don't have to do it out loud, you can if you want, to tell God that idol that you're going to cast down starting tonight. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we worship you tonight. We, we celebrate you tonight. It's the Sabbath, Lord. I can rest in your grace. But tonight, Lord, there's, there are some idols. They exist. We've allowed it to get in. And tonight, we want to let it go. Because God, there is a destiny, there is a fulfillment a purpose that, that, that you want to accomplish in our lives. But guess what? We can't do it unless that idol is still there. We've got to let it go. We've got to cast down every idol. You're not intimidated by that idol. As a matter of fact, you want to put in place of that idol the Holy Spirit, the things of God, the things that we can enjoy. As a matter of fact, it's a much better experience. You said your, your burden is easy and your yoke is light. Father, right now, I pray that you'll take it all away tonight, every person under the sound of my voice. I pray right now as they get ready to, uh, to, to lift up to you, as you listen to these prayers right now in your sanctuary, I pray that you would wipe the slate clean tonight. Right now, Father, they're going to talk to you. Just listen to them right now, Father. They're talking to you in their hearts. Many of them may be talking to you out loud or whispering, but listen to them right now, Father. We let it go, Lord, we let it go. Whatever it is, we surrender that thing. You can take it, God. You can take it. Jesus, thank you for listening to us. Thank you for loving us. Keep us safe as we leave this place. May we continue to experience your presence and encounter you for the rest of the Sabbath hours and even beyond. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a, a hand clap of praise to celebrate his goodness? I want to thank you. I want to thank you again. Thank you for coming out to the... Uh...